Welcome. Everything is fine. You are listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're looking at Season 1, Episode 5, Category 55, Emergency Doomsday Crisis. Best title of an episode ever. It's pretty great. Yeah. (laughs) This episode was written by Matt Murray. He's written for SNL, Parks and Rec, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and Community. And Jason and I both love Community, so I don't know if you remember, but he wrote Advanced Gay and Virtual Systems Analysis, which was the Dreamatorium episode. Right. With Annie and Abed, which is a really good episode, so. And this episode was directed by Morgan Sackett. He was an executive producer on Parks and Rec, and he was an associate producer on Seinfeld. So he's been in the game for a while. Awesome. Yeah. And this episode originally aired October 6, 2016. Let's get right into it. Okie dokie. While running an errand, Eleanor lets a neighbor pass her in line. She's extremely pleased that she's learning to be considerate of others and relays the news to Chidi. The focus of this week's ethics class is utilitarianism. So this episode is kind of fun right off the bat, don't you find? I don't know. Maybe that's just me. (laughs) I just love how excited Eleanor is when she's getting her ice cream and she realizes, holy crap, I did something amazing. She blows it way out of proportion, (laughs) but she's so proud of herself. She is. It's nice enough to let people bite you in line, so... I couldn't help but notice some of the flavors of frozen yogurt include things like finding a kidney donor, recognized actor's voice from commercial voiceover, which I do all the time, so I would probably want that flavor. It's like, pause this, let me Google it. (laughs) Who was that voice? I know it from somewhere. Or I've seen that random actor in like one thing before i think and i'm gonna think about it for the whole entire episode unless we figure it out right now yeah yeah pretty much uh there was also your favorite theme song and the softness of a puppy's tiny ears oh what would your favorite theme song be what would the the frozen yogurt taste like to you interesting um probably something classic like the simpsons oh. because i grew up on it and would watch it every day at five o'clock. Oh, so that's sweet. It'd probably be something like that. Have a lot of good memories attached to it. Yeah. And yours? Buffy. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Definitely <Yeah. laughs> Buffy, because if I'm listening to the theme song, it means I'm watching an episode of Buffy, which is perfect. Which is always so, good. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say Lost, but then I was like, wait. Lost no, doesn't really, it doesn't really I mean, there's have there's music. One. There's sounds. Creepy sounds. Yeah. <laughs> So we have our first real lesson with Eleanor and Jason, Mm -hmm. which is cute. It's It's, fun. It's nice to see Jason joining them. Do you think that Chidi decided to do something a little bit more simple because it was Jason's first lesson? (laughs) Very likely. Okay. But But we're still surprised at his grasping knowledge of it. Yeah, well, he understood the utilitarian dilemma, like, right away. As soon as Chidi mentioned it and sort of gave, like, a very quick example, he knew he was exactly like, hey, what it meant. I know. I got a, I got a story here. It's yeah. a little Sheila, off the wall, the but... alligator dealer, which... Uh, <laughs> is that a thing? Yeah, like, um, the skin. Oh, so they don't just, like, sell, like, live alligators to people? I mean, I don't I was, know what you would. I just assumed have a the skin for, for that, like but... purses and oh. belts and stuff, but maybe it was live. I mean, it's probably live now that I'm thinking about it because Jason's a pretty kooky guy, so he probably has some pretty wacky friends selling alligators out of their garage. Dang. Well, that makes it sadder. I think. I don't know. <laughs> Does that make it sadder? Anyway, not the point. Um. But really, this is one of the reasons I don't think he's as stupid as he seems. Like, he gets it right away. Honestly, I thought he got it purely on fluke. Oh, okay. I didn't. So, (laughs) yeah, I don't know. I I guess I just figured he he understood what Chidi was saying. Yeah, I think he understood that the greater good idea. Yeah. And Jason was immediately like, hey, I know a greater good story. And that was it. Oh, eh. 
But. Well, yeah. I don't know. I still don't think he's as dumb as he seems. You think there's more beneath the surface? There could be. There could be things. Layers, Jason. Layers. He could be an onion for all we know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's get to our Chidi's chalkboard philosophy corner, I guess. Okay. So we discussed utilitarianism in our first episode, but I'll sort of just reiterate the gist of this moral theory. So utilitarianism focuses on the consequences of our actions and treats intentions as pretty much irrelevant. Right. It states that the best action is one that maximizes utility. And that utility is usually described as the sum of all pleasure that results from an action minus the suffering of anyone involved in the action. So when we were talking about the point system, it was sort of that idea of like being able to assign like a point value to all the pleasure that is derived from something and then just saying, okay, that number minus a number that represents the sadness right. or the without, suffering. Without taking into account intention. Because mm-hmm. that's completely null and void in utilitarianism. Yeah. And Chidi brings up the utilitarian dilemma, which Jason understands. He says that if all that matters is the sum total of goodness, that you can justify any number of bad actions. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't bring up other objections to this theory, probably because Jason sort of derails the lesson. But there are other objections, such as the concern to respect individual rights and the concern of higher and lower pleasures. Like in Chidi's example, he says killing an innocent person to save millions or to save hundreds. Right. We're not respecting the right of that individual. Of that individual and their right to live. And the concern of higher and lower pleasures is something that John Stuart Mill addressed in some of his work on utilitarianism. So the idea of higher and lower pleasures, like what kind of pleasure is more important than another. So. So, for example, the pleasure that the Romans derived from watching gladiators fight, would that collective pleasure of watching people fight, would it outweigh the suffering of the gladiators themselves? Or because that pleasure is kind of like a base animalistic pleasure, could you really say that's equivalent to maybe the pleasure of watching your kid learn to ride a bike for the first time. Like, something more pure, I suppose, Uh right? I actually watched a bunch of videos on YouTube. Uh, There's this series of lectures from a Harvard professor named Michael Sandel, and he does this whole series on justice and moral philosophy. So it's really interesting if you want to check it out. And that's where I got the example of the gladiators. Jeez, that's uh, that's pretty heavy. Mm-hmm. Comparing the pleasure of watching people destroy each other oh, and watching a child grow up. Yeah, the watch like being there for your child's birth mm-hmm. would that be something like a pleasure more important than the pleasure that you get from having a bowl of your favorite ice cream at the end of a hard day? <laughs> you know, and most people would say, "Yeah, hey." Seeing my child being born was way better than this bowl of, like, cookie dough ice cream. Which you forget later on. So, it, it's interesting. There's a lot of uh, a lot of concerns with utilitarianism. So, Chidi has on his chalkboard two people. And I already mentioned one of them, John Stuart Mill. And Eleanor was reading his book. Yes, and she was episode. reading. Mm-hmm. Chidi also wrote down the name Jeremy Bentham. He was the founder of modern utilitarianism... But his version of utilitarianism is now referred to as act utilitarianism or classic utilitarianism. But it was criticized. There were a lot of concerns with his moral theory. So rule utilitarianism began. And this version of the theory says that we ought to live by rules that in general are likely to lead to the greatest good for the greatest number. So this theory allows us to refrain from acts that might maximize happiness in the short run. Things like framing Sheila or killing one innocent person to save millions. Right. So someone like Jeremy Bentham would say that we ought to perform whatever act would result in the most happiness, while a rule utilitarian would say that we ought to conduct ourselves according to a set of rules, such that following them would result in the greatest amount of well-being. 
So it's more what we live by in our society. Like we follow rules that we hope will lead to the greatest amount of well-being. Right. And we have rules in place to defend our individual rights and... Laws. Yeah, exactly. Now, how do you think this discussion of utilitarianism relates to this episode in particular? Eleanor seems to be forgetting about Chidi and his well-being. And she's thinking more about herself. So Chidi is becoming noticeably distraught. Yes, definitely. Throughout the episode. And Eleanor is just, we got to keep learning. I want to keep doing, I got to keep studying. I got to do all this stuff. You got to teach me. You got to do this. You got to do that. So she's kind of ignoring, well, his right to be happy. Yeah. She's not being vindictive at all. No, no, no. I don't think it's born out of any kind of like hatred or like desire to keep him from happiness or anything like that. I think it's purely her not thinking about how this situation really affects him in the long run. Which is what Eleanor has been known to do in the past. She's only thinking about herself. Yeah, she's short-sighted when it comes to other people. Yeah. I wonder if I'll be able to sort of unpick if there's any more relevance in other characters' stories this episode, or if I can dig a little deeper in there, because this particular ethics lesson felt sort of like treading old territory. Like we've already kind we've of... We've already been there. We've already covered it. We've discussed it a bit and the show has as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm interested to see if we come up with anything else. So another great moment when Eleanor says that she wrote a paper on the concept of Dharma and she wanted GD to grade it for her. Six whole pages. Six pages. Six whopping pages. So I, I thought that was... double spaced. Because that would just make it like three pages. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was fantastic because the concept of Dharma is so not simple. Mm-hmm. It's convoluted. It doesn't really translate for Western culture. Mm-hmm. It's a concept that a lot of different religions, um, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism, uh, they all follow this concept but it means something different for each of them Mm -hmm. and so which one is she exploring in her paper that's what i I was wondering all of them that's why it's so fantastic to me it's such a great joke if you understand that the concept of dharma is no way possible to write six page paper on it yes yes and coming uh... from eleanor no less it was it was funny. Maybe was, she misunderstood everything yeah. and actually watched Lost and then started to do a paper on that. Oh, you know what? Probably. Yeah, that's more <laughs> likely. <laughs> she started watching it late one night. She was tired and she had just gotten out of class with Chidi. <laughs> and she was like, oh, this is what he meant. Right. It all makes sense I now. I get it now. Okay. Okay. So she's just like referencing like Why Sawyer. is he blabbing about all these books when I could have just been watching the show? Yeah. Gosh. Jeez, Cheaty, come on. Make it simple for a girl. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll move on. At Tahani's brunch party, Janet informs Michael of a Category 55 emergency doomsday crisis. The sinkhole is not repairing itself, and Tahani mentions she saw it expand. Michael leaves behind important documents, and Tahani seizes the opportunity to sneak a peek at the neighborhood rankings. Eleanor is eager to continue her lessons. But Chidi is distant and evasive. In a flashback, Tahani's drawing is upstaged by her sister's sculpture. <laughs> Tahani flashbacks. Yeah, so we're getting into our episode. Yep. And before we get into Tahani's first flashback, I have to say that Kristen Bell is so charming because sometimes she'll just pop out these little jokes, these little quips, and I just die laughing like the way she says these things chidi comes out and she's got this little dance and she says whip out that chalkboard big boy show me what you're working with (laughs) and it's just it's fantastic she's so cute and i feel like if i was chidi i'd just look at her with this like these hard eyes i don't know i would melt are you kidding i would just be like oh my god no no (laughs) see i find stuff like that just Completely adorable. (laughs) Well, she is adorable. She really is. (laughs) All right, so it's a Tahani episode. Mm -hmm. But she's not the doomsday crisis, like we said last episode. Yeah, that's (laughs) true. 
No, Tahani's not the Doomsday Crisis. It's that terrible sinkhole. Yes, that awful sinkhole that I'm assuming will be around for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think of the first flashback we get from Tahani? It was so frustrating hearing her sister. I don't know why it bugged me so much, but she's so obnoxious. Oh, her sister? Completely. Camilla's the worst. She's literally the worst. And what is with that hair? Girl, uh-uh. You're it's making, like, like weird swirlies tw- on her. Oh, uh, she's like wearing a helmet from the future. I feel I don't like know. that's probably a style. She's from the Hunger Games. But it's a bad she's style. She's from like District 13. Personally, not a fan of it. Especially when it's like super gelled on your forehead, but then the rest of your hair is poofy. Girl, get someone to take care of that. Anyway, so, <laughs> but really, her parents are even worse. So they're like her parents the completely worst, ignore her. capital T, capital W. Yeah, her parents completely ignore her and basically think she's trash. Like everything you're doing is worthless. Yeah. Why can't you be more like your sister? And her drawing was cute. It was nice. Yeah, her bird had a hat. It was a cute hat. I don't know. Like, the drawing itself was actually quite good, and her yeah. shading and coloring was very nice. Like, there was nothing wrong with her drawing. But nope. then you get her parents saying, oh, well, that's too commonplace. Basically, you know? yeah. Well, look, it looks like a bird. It is a bird. Boring. Yeah. Ugh, rude. So, yeah. Um, we get another mention of Brancusi, or yeah. however you say his name. Mm-hmm. And he also, uh, Tani's dad also mentions Kapoor. So I looked up this guy and it turns out that one of Anish Kapoor's most well-known sculptures is the Cloud Gate, which is often referred to as the Bean in Chicago. The Bean. Yeah. It's that massive that, sculpture. Like it looks like a little mirror, bean. But it's, it's like huge? Yeah. It's a huge like oh, right, reflective right, right. surface. Yeah. Okay. So I'm guessing because of the... Uh, the, the material that yeah. she used okay. yeah that's what he's saying but it's kind of a nice little shout out i was like oh cool mm, i'm pretty sure that big bean is uh, plays a big part at the end of that jake gyllenhaal movie the source code i don't think i've seen that one it's no okay. i definitely have not seen that one <laughs> anyway so it makes this episode makes me sympathize a little bit more with tahani yeah oh, because definitely. because she's been awful this whole season so far like i just find her so irritating to watch I mean, I love her, but she's irritating as a person. Okay, so you like you love to hate her. Oh, absolutely, for all right, sure. All right. Every time she says something, I can't wait to hear how condescending she is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and how she's gonna like put down somebody with a compliment. All right. So you're not just looking at your watch, rolling your eyes. No, 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 no. Don't misunderstand over. me here. Oh, I, okay. I, I enjoy. Yeah, I enjoy everything about her. Mm-hmm. And these are the first flashbacks of a character who didn't accidentally end up in the good place. So far, we've only had flashbacks from Eleanor and from Jason, and we both knew that those people were terrible. Yeah. So now we're getting to see a different, a bit of a different kind of flashback, exploring yeah. different emotions. Because and... we know Tahani belongs in the good place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's going off of what Chidi said a couple episodes ago. Like, did you ever think that maybe Tahani has her own anxieties and insecurities? Mm-hmm. And Eleanor says, well, no. We're going to see those. But she episode. has real big ones, yeah. deep-seated <laughs> ones, for sure. Big family issues. Yeah. And then I was sort of wondering while I was watching Tahani's flashbacks, just because her parents are so overly uninterested in her mm-hmm. and all of her pursuits and so completely enamored with you know her sibling, that I couldn't help but think maybe her memories are kind of subjective. Like, maybe her sister wasn't that amazing, mm-hmm. but she felt like she was because she was always being ignored. I was thinking about that as I was watching this episode, and I totally agree with you. I think that her memory is a little one-sided for all these flashbacks. Mm-hmm. So we can discuss those a little bit more as we encounter the new flashbacks, but I, I definitely would agree with you in that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Dang right, you do. You agree with me. You better agree with me or else I'm not cooking you dinner. I'm not cooking you dinner anyway. You're going out. <laughs> <laughs> well, fine. <laughs> Chidi relents to Eleanor's questioning and admits that he's frustrated that teaching her has become a full-time job. Just as Chidi is about to leave, 
Michael announces that everyone must stay in their home for their own safety. A few days later, Chidi and Eleanor are still arguing. Michael asks them to host a couple that live near the sinkhole. Bart and... Nina. Nina. Yeah, Bart and Nina. They're pretty great, right? (laughs) They're pretty awesome. Oh man, I love them. (laughs) This is really my favorite part of the episode. I love this dynamic between the four of them. I love seeing Eleanor just kind of on edge and cheaty, totally freaking out. (laughs) It's such a cliche, like, oh, we've got a secret and we're about to be found out. But they do it so well that I can completely look past it. Yeah, well, it just, it's like their jobs are just a little too perfect. Way too on the nose. Yeah, so they're totally screwed. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm really glad that we have an episode where we get to explore Chidi's feelings, because up to this point, it's pretty much just been all about Eleanor. Mm -hmm. Like, even when she was asking him to help her in the first few episodes, she never took into account how he would feel about it, and he never discussed it with her. Well, she's using him as a tool and not as a person. Yes. Yeah, we were talking uh, a couple episodes ago about whether or not she sees him as a person, Mm -hmm. right? Or if she sees him as a means to to an end. end. Yeah. Means to an end. Exactly. And he has a right to feel frustrated and angry and disappointed. And feel used. Yeah, like his whole afterlife, which is a forever thing, has been basically ruined in a way by her. Not ruined. Not ruined, but derailed. Definitely derailed. Definitely derailed, for sure. I also like seeing other members of the neighborhood. Yes, it is nice to see other other neighbors. We mm-hmm. don't see them too often, and this is probably the most time we've spent with anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Any other people other than, like, our core sixth? I really like the build-up to this when Eleanor is just laying on the couch with the welcome channel on, which, turn that thing off because it's so <laughs> annoying. I'm right there with Chidi. I just identify a lot with Chidi in this episode because... I have a lot of anxiety. I'm a very anxious person. And the idea of having two guests arrive unexpectedly, oh my gosh, so much anxiety (laughs) because there are so many dishes and I just like, I hate having people over when my house is messy. So that would stress me out. And then I would of course have everything else on top of it. But Mm. like underneath there would still be a little person in my head saying, But you have dirty dishes everywhere. That's disgusting. And people are going to think you're a slob. And there's (laughs) probably clothes hanging around or there's dust somewhere or... Yeah. And there's just certain people that like, you know, any kind of mess stresses them out. I'm not necessarily that kind of person. I can be messy, (laughs) but I don't like other people to see it, you know? Yeah. (laughs) And Eleanor is definitely more of the whatever mentality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's like, let him judge me, I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, and we get, uh, I don't, we haven't mentioned at this point in the episode that we watched the extended version. Right. Which has five extra minutes to this episode, and we get all these little scene extensions or little scenes that we don't really have. Some extra lines Mm -hmm. and some, a rearrangement of a couple scenes. So we highly recommend that you're watching the extended episodes. Or do what we do. Watch them side by side. (laughs) It's quite interesting. You're the one who watches them side by side. (laughs) I don't do that. I can't focus like that. (laughs) But yes, we highly encourage you to watch the extended episodes either on the NBC website or on Hulu Plus, which I guess has them now. Mm. Or, you know, other means. But uh, yeah, definitely try and find them. There's a lot of really good stuff. Some great jokes that you're going to miss out on and maybe some important lines too. Yeah, there's some scenes and some lines that we've talked about in previous episodes that we feel as watchers they should have left in. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I understand that sometimes you need to cut time for the network, but come on. The advertisers can hold on to their britches because we need to watch some good place. Full uncut. Yeah, actually, one of our listeners um, mentioned that the ads on the NBC website have been pretty great because they tend to be ads that are relating to the stuff that's going on in the episode. Really? So when she was watching the pilot episode of The Good Place, she saw an ad for shrimp. Oh, my gosh. And she saw an ad for 
some kind of new drug. And of course, Eleanor, you know, yep. was selling fake, basically fake drugs, oh, which yeah. is exactly what Jason was doing. Yep. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize that until now. Anyway, they both sold fake drugs. And, uh, That's and why of she course, was the blind okay. shrimp. That's why she was okay when he said, oh, I sold fake drugs to high school or like college kids. And then she was like, okay, now we're talking. <laughs> She's like, well, I did that too. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I yeah. get it. Kindred spirits. Yeah. But anyway, I brought all that up because there's this nice little conversation between Chidi and Eleanor as they're cleaning up some dishes, which I was like, good job, good job. That's probably what I'd do. (laughs) Leave my guests alone and do my dishes. (laughs) Uh, And Chidi's just freaking out. He's so worried. And uh, Eleanor suggests saying things that aren't lies, like Eleanor is super hot or... I'm Chidi. I lost my virginity to a book. <laughs> Which is so mean. So mean. But I laughed so hard. So hard. Oh, God. Yeah. It was just perfect. Anyway, it was a great line. All right. So we'll move on. Tahani desperately tries to increase her score by serving others. In a flashback, Tahani's parents are critical of the measly 5.2 million pounds raised at her fundraiser and they demand she add a lunch date with her sister to help them increase the amount. The observant couple, Nina and Bart, conclude that Chidi and Eleanor are in conflict. Hmm. Oh, they are most definitely in conflict. They're they're squabbling. Squabble, squabble. Squabble, squabble. I love the look Eleanor gives to him right at that moment. She looks at him like, what (sighs) is even going on? Why would you? Why? Stop. No. (laughs) You are ruining this. But I still, I relate to Chidi. I would say something probably really dumb in that moment. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so does Tahani's sister remind you of anybody in popular culture? M.I.A. M.I.A.? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's, uh, I don't even know who that is. You don't know who that is? That's <laughs> no. the, the singer of the I'm song old. who's like, poof, 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 and take your money. <laughs> All I want to do is ding, ding, ding. No? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But why her? Galang Galang and all those songs. Um, because she's like a icon, like a fashion icon, a pop icon. She's an activist. She's got kind of like a quirky, unique style. So she looks a little bit like her in this uh, in this particular flashback. Like she's just really talented and kind of off the wall. Interesting, hmm. you know. That's mainly why I thought of her. Why? Okay. Who were you thinking of? Yoko Ono. Oh. Oh yeah. Why? Somebody who's awful and, like, ruins everything. (laughs) Well, no, no. no. Oh, harsh. Somebody who has all sorts of talents, like Mm -hmm. uh, performance, music, activist, um, very unique look. Yeah, okay. Kind of weird. I don't know. Honestly, I thought she was gorgeous in this flashback. I looked at her and I was like, yep, I can, like, dig this whole style. (laughs) Just her hair and, like... That weird top that showed part of like a frillyish bra underneath and those weird pants. I don't know. I loved it. It's super uh, yeah. weird. She was gorgeous, but then the arrogance just like washing off of her was tangible and uh, mm-hmm. not a big fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was kind of awful as kind as per always. Yeah, I don't know though. Like as much as I hate her sister, her parents are so much worse. They really they are. They put so much pressure on her. Like, her mom comes up and the first thing she says is, well, this isn't going to turn out to be an embarrassing failure. It's so stupid because they say, oh, you're, you've only raised 5.2 million pounds. And then as soon as the sister gets up to auction herself off, Mm -hmm. her dad offers up another another 5 5 million. million. So why couldn't he have done that when Tahani needed extra money to be raised? Because he doesn't love her. Because he doesn't. Or he doesn't care that much about her, clearly. Because he wanted a lunch date with his daughter. Well, she's probably very busy Holy with all of her moly. Grammys and BAFTAs or whatever. And Olympic medals and... Yeah. Whatever. I don't know. Or Nobel Peace Prize. Whatever. I'm over her. Yeah, I'm so over it. <laughs> she's like so last year's news. <laughs> I um, love the one line, the most likely to be Banksy. Oh my god. That was fantastic. Yeah, too. and when her, her sister does that little shy, oh no, no, no let's yeah. not talk about that, and puts her finger in front of her lips. Yeah, but don't tell anybody. <sighs> It'll be our little secret. Oh god. Do people still not know who Banksy is? Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. I like don't follow that stuff, I guess. Huh. Interesting. Impressive. 
Yeah. Dang. She could be Banksy. Anyway, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> but watching this moment after seeing the um, the first flashback, I really did feel for Tahani. Her parents really make her question her worth. They mm-hmm. mess with her sense of self. And being in the good place was really her first real confirmation of her success. Mm-hmm. So when she sees that she barely got in... She doesn't think of it as like, oh, I'm 300th out of billions of people. She thinks I'm at the bottom of the list. Yeah, I'm at the bottom of the list. And these people who maybe I don't think should be as high, like Eleanor, Eleanor, you know, she kind of side eyes when she sees Eleanor's six on the list. Yeah, I think... I think we uh, all did a little bit. Oh, yeah, definitely. (laughs) I mean, how is she that high on the list? But... uh, (laughs) Above Chidi. She... She is above Chidi, you're right. Oh, whoa. Weird. I wonder where Chidi was, because we really didn't get any confirmation on that. No. Um, yeah, it's her first confirmation of the success, and now even that's kind of tainted for her, mm-hmm. right? It's it's an upsetting moment. I I don't know. Like, I don't relate exactly. Um, my parents have always been supportive of me and, you know, have always thought really good things about me. But I know what that feels like to feel kind of competitive with a sibling. Mm -hmm. Like, I have an older brother, and for a long time, I was always kind of the good kid, right? (laughs) And I I loved getting that that praise because I was doing good things, I was doing good in school, and things were not so great for him. And as much as I wanted things to be good for him, I also kind of enjoyed... Being the good one. Being the good one, yeah. Feeling a little bit of that moral superiority, I guess, right? And now... And now my brother is doing great, and he has a successful business, and he has two kids, and, uh, like, a good marriage, and as much as I'm happy for him, sometimes I feel a little bit competitive. You know, I'm sort of like, oh, well, great. Now, if I'm not doing as well in one of these aspects of my life, then I start to feel a little bit bad that I'm not as good as my brother, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is such a dumb feeling to have. And I don't particularly like having it, but it is true. I'm, As... I'm getting honest up in here, guys. <laughs> don't judge me, please. <laughs> but it is it is true, yeah. I, I can know. relate to it somewhat with friends and coworkers or whatever mm-hmm. being more advanced in their quote-unquote life experiences and whatever they're going through. Or But it's everyone goes at their own pace, and I don't have somebody to directly compete with yeah so it's a little bit different and of course you're not having your parents completely ignore you while praising another child exactly right so tahani's getting it real bad yes she is so do you think that this actually happened do you think that her sister had all of these accomplishments and that her parents I'm told sure her she all had, these things i feel like she had a lot of accomplishments but mm-hmm. maybe not as many as she was rambling off mm. it's it's almost like, hey, here's a few accomplishments, and it just sounds like so many more and so many more. So I imagine you know? that as they were bidding that extra money, they were staring directly at Tahani while they were doing it. <laughs> like, could you imagine? What oh if? Oh my gosh. What if something else on that like fundraiser list had been a date with Tahani? Or a lunch date with Tahani, and they Ooh. didn't even bid on it. Yeah. Okay. I can totally cannon. see that. Yep, yep. That's it. It's like next on the bidding list is a date with me. Crickets. Just crickets from her parents. Oof. Oh, so harsh. So, so harsh. So, talking about Tahani's fundraiser. Yes. We can discuss the email that we received from Strangely Literal. Yes, thank you. Thank you for emailing us. We love hearing feedback and yes. thoughts. And I'm so glad that uh, we inspired you to watch the show. So what you had said in your email was, I'll, I'll just quote you here. Uh, I feel like a big part of the way Tahani is represented sends the message that it's really easy to do good things if you're super privileged. Which is absolutely true in society. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Bill Gates is like a bajillionaire and he does amazing things because he's so wealthy. Yes. He did 
earn that wealth. Absolutely. He worked his butt off. And Whereas he created Tahani, some fantastic things. Yeah. Tahani did not earn her wealth. No, she was born into she her wealth. She was born into it. So she's doing great things being born into wealth. I mean, mm-hmm. she's not ruining her life or wasting the money and mm-hmm. whatever. She's, she's, she's not using the money to go party and buy, like, speedboats for all her friends. Right. But do you think... This is me thinking here. Um, do you think that she's trying to be this incredible person because she wants praise from her family? Yeah, absolutely. So if her parents cared about her as much as they did her sister, Camilla, would she be doing all these fundraisers? Mm. Would she be trying to raise, you know, $60 billion? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting yeah. to think about uh, another thing that you mentioned in Actually, your email. Actually, I just, oh. just want to mention here, I think that part of the reason that Tahani does this mostly, like, most of her good deeds were from raising money for, mm-hmm. for charities. But I think that why she doesn't have as many accomplishments compared to her sister is because her parents never encouraged her. So we hear that, you know, her sister is really gifted in all these areas, like, um filmmaking and um like art and all this kind of stuff Mm -hmm. but her parents never really tried to encourage that artistic ability or anything really else in Tahani so I think that Tahani saw what she could do and just went with it right you know something that would be easy enough Mm -hmm. I guess I don't know that makes it sound like there's no actual talent involved for raising money. And there is. Clearly, she puts on these, like, really extravagant uh, events and everything. She knows how to plan a, a fundraiser. Yeah. But that's something that might not be as valued in her parents' eyes oh, as absolutely. something like, Definitely not. you know, winning a Grammy. Yeah. So, yeah, that makes me a little bit sadder for Tahani because Well, that's the next never part know. of this email. Um Accomplishing great things for lots of people with very little effort because you have so many resources. Mm -hmm. Planning all this stuff. It could be looked at as not as much effort as being an award-winning gymnast or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And the quote from the Bible saying that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Because rich people have so many resources to be able to do incredible things. But that's saying that just because you're rich doesn't mean you're going to get into heaven. Let's scrap the utilitarian idea Mm -hmm. and we'll go with the standard Christian, Judeo-Christian idea of heaven. Mm -hmm. Would Tahani have gotten in? I don't know. Would it outweigh? Exactly. Would the amount of money that she raised... Which, of course, that money goes towards helping people. Like, would all of that pleasure be able to outweigh any negative intentions from Mm -hmm. her? Or less than noble intentions? Right. Yeah. It's interesting to think. Yeah. It's interesting to just, yeah, sort of keep that stuff in mind. Thank you for your email. Yes, thank you. All right, so let's get to Chidi and Eleanor. And them having a panic, basically. (laughs) And yelling at each other in front of their guests. Well, yeah. behind a glass, but also sort of in front of their guests. Mm-hmm. Which made me question, why is there a giant window in your bathroom? Is that where they were? In the bathroom? They were in a bathroom. Yeah. Oh. She puts her wine glass down on the top of their toilet. And she's I sort of shoving attention. him against a sink. And then, of course, we have this moment. They're they're yelling at each other. And then Chidi notices, oh, hey, our guests are watching us through that giant window. I thought they were in the bedroom. No. Obviously, they're not in the bedroom because the clown doors haven't... Giant window. Super weird. Yeah, it's a little weird. And it leads to outside? I mean, you don't want a window that just is inside of your house because no one wants to be on the couch watching someone go to the john. But what's up with that? This Wait, house people is weird. go to the bathroom in a good place? I guess people go to the bathroom in a good place, yeah. Interesting. Oh, that is kind of weird. Huh. Bodies in the good place are very interesting because Tahani at the end, Does or near the end, has a has a little bit of a weird face. She glitches. Glitch, yeah. So we were talking 
in the second episode about Michael creating the dog and how the dog was just a construct. Yeah. And we were talking about all the bodies in the good place. And it the is Picasso kind of... face. Yeah, it is kind of weird to think, like, would I, these bodies really have, like, a digestive system? Would you be eating and then, you know, needing to go to the bathroom? Like... I think Michael wanted to keep it as familiar as possible. Well, that makes sense, actually. I like that. So he creates everybody the way they were meant to be instead of just like floating around consciousnesses just yeah to have familiar routines familiar bodily reactions right. that kind of stuff but taking out some of the negative things like hangovers yeah yeah headaches yeah stuff like that yeah although chidi's still getting stomach aches and probably quite a lot of them this episode because he's yeah, real probably. stressed out um i love when eleanor says to chidi Oh, why don't you go put one of those trademark taupe v-neck sweaters on? Because you know how strongly I feel about those. Eleanor hates those things. <laughs> she hates them. That was not a lie. She feels strongly, but she feels strongly about how much she direction. hates them. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because that is such a, like, professor outfit that mm-hmm. she would probably be like, Oh, cheaty, really? You're so lame right now. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's how I feel. <laughs> And then they're arguing, and then Eleanor mm-hmm. says, let's not do that thing where we suddenly say, oh, this is getting hot, and then start making out. And then she says, oh, well, let's let's just do it. Yeah. And she looks like she's, she's ready to go ahead. So this is our... Which totally surprised me. Really? Completely. Because I haven't gotten that feeling of attraction from either of them mm-hmm. at any point. Okay. Which makes sense, kind of, because... She's just saying, oh, let's just, it's kind of like a spontaneous thing. Yeah. Yeah. But But this is our first hint that she is attracted to him. Like, she would sleep with him. Probably. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And Chidi is completely thrown off. But Eleanor trying to make it happen is kind of adorable. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Especially (laughs) since we've had the little hints that Eleanor thinks that the couple want to swing with them. Mm Mm-hmm. Just... Some some extra sexy stuff this episode. Yeah. And I mean, he doesn't have a soulmate here. She doesn't have a soulmate here. They're That's stuck because together. she doesn't belong here. Maybe it'll happen someday is all I'm saying. Do we... The stars will align. As far as her soulmate, we don't know. Maybe he's still alive or she's still alive. I mean, I am part of the Eleanor's by train, so... <laughs> gotta go with that but maybe her soulmate is still alive and they're on earth but what happens or if maybe you go they're to the in bad... the bad place right what if you go to the bad place and your soulmate is in the bad place with you i feel like you wouldn't get soulmates in the bad place because soulmates are supposed to be a good thing right no or would they're... you get a soulmate only to be able to watch them suffer i feel like everybody has a soulmate regardless of what you're whether you're doomed to go to the good place or the bad place so everyone has two parts so okay. regardless of where you end up you yeah. still have to have a soulmate do you think it could be possible that someone has a soulmate that's in the bad place while they're in the good place because that seems unlikely like how why would you be soulmates with someone who's infinitely crappier than you are maybe they just made some wrong decisions i guess so if it is just based off points maybe they they hit a make real cut off yeah I mean, he says you're out of, like, one of 300-some people out of billions mm-hmm. that made it into this place, so maybe they just didn't meet the cutoff. Yeah. That's sad to think about, though, because then you just never meet your soulmate. A little depressing. But I'm trying to imagine, what would soulmates in the bad place look like? Or would you still have a soulmate, and then they just torture your soulmate, and you get to feel, like, infinitely worse because you're watching someone that you love be hurt? For eternity. Yeah. Along with you getting hurt. Maybe we'll uh, see some answers. Yeah. It's exciting. There's a lot of cool stuff to think about. A lot of questions. A lot of questions, yeah. Nina and Bart mediate a conversation between Chidi and Eleanor. Chidi reveals that this is his first real relationship, and this isn't exactly what he'd hoped it would be. Tahani leaves her home to help Michael, 
but her proximity to the sinkhole causes unwanted side effects on her, and Janet has to knock her out. First of all, what kind of paradise is this if they don't have a dishwasher? The worst. Maybe <laughs> Eleanor, the the Eleanor they thought she was, loved doing dishes. Oh. She was just so happy to do, to do dishes. Yeah, that's sad. <laughs> And I, I get Chidi's point here. Like, he just blurts it out because he's frustrated and it's something safe enough to say. Like, being able to say, oh, I have to do the dishes all the time and mm-hmm. she never does them. Doesn't say, hey, she doesn't belong here. Yeah, It's exactly. just a common complaint you get in relationships, right? right? Like, someone is doing a bit more than I am. Right. Or I feel like I'm doing more than them. I like that the show subverts our expectations when Bart is saying, you're hiding something. And we Mm -hmm. immediately expect it to be about Eleanor. We're all looking at Eleanor like, "Uh uh-oh, he's on to you, girl. Mm Mm-hmm. And he's going to ream you out or something like that. And then we get Chidi. Chidi. It's like, what what could Chidi be hiding other than, like, frustration? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, And Eleanor tells him, you know, be the exact right amount of honest so that both of us can be happy. Yeah. And I really felt awful for Chidi. Like, he can't confide in anyone. He's and in that's a terrible part of the situation. problem. Like, he can't really vent out all his frustration on Eleanor. That's not fair. And I know that's part of what he's thinking. Like, he doesn't want to give all of that to one person. Mm-hmm. But he's frustrated because who is he supposed to talk to? He can't talk to Michael. He can't talk to Tahani or Jason, really. Like, Jason's too stupid. He could he's not going to get it. Could he not talk to Janet? I don't think it occurs to him to talk to Janet. Yeah. And really, he needs, you know, like, counseling about this kind of stuff. He's clearly not very in touch with his emotions. Or if he is, he's not great at communicating them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I really did feel really bad for him in this moment. And then, of course, I had some feelings about Chidi and Eleanor because he says... In the extended episode. Yes. In the extended episode, he says, when Nina asks, what do you do to make Eleanor feel valued? And by the way, Nina's doing a great job here. And he says, I spend every waking moment thinking about her and supporting her. And my heart just melted. Because Eleanor has this look on her face like, wow, this person who's so frustrated with me is just giving me all of their energy, all of their kindness. Mm -hmm. And you really see it on her face. Like, she has this wonderful moment of gratitude. Like, this look of gratitude It's almost like realization. Yeah. Just sudden, like, oh. Yeah. And it can be read as very sad. Like, that's what he's spending all of his time on. Yeah. And that's frustrating because he should be able to be, you know, enjoying his time in paradise and pursuing his own goals. But he's so focused on her. But at the same time, it's delivered in this, like, semi-romantic kind of way. And they have, they share this look together. Mm -hmm. And I just, I got some feelings. Anyway, yeah. The scene is very different uh, without that moment. Yeah, it is. It definitely has a very different feeling. It's, it feels way more comedic than emotional. Mm -hmm. That line really brings us back to, hey, this is, this is the problem. Is he's spending all of his time yeah. on her. And that's hard. And he's trying so hard to support someone that's not his soulmate. Or and that doesn't belong here. And that doesn't belong here. And yeah. it's literally eating him up inside. Yeah. Oh. Hence the stomach aches. Oh, <laughs> that's so sad. Don't tell me that. He's having like <laughs> Eleanor ulcers. Anyway. Oh. Um so I've been listening to this podcast called How Story Works. It's from Chipperish Media, which is a Lonnie Diane Rich uh, project. And this podcast is sort of meant for writers, but also for people who just enjoy story. And in one of the episodes, Lonnie explains the difference between mundane conflict and narrative conflict. So mundane conflict is bickering, right? And that we're getting a lot of that in this episode. Like, Chidi and Eleanor are bickering. They're... They're squabbling. Yes, they're squabbling. Squabble, squabble. And she mentions, uh, Lonnie mentions, that a good way to determine whether or not the conflict is mundane is the conversation test. So if your two characters can sit down and talk out their problem, then it's not a strong conflict. Sometimes we see that in movies, you know... There's this moment where if only the love interest of the girl could tell her 
that he didn't mean that. Or oh, God, that, just talk about it. Yeah, or you saw something, but it wasn't what you thought it was, you know, and once they finally have a conversation, the conflict is over. Mm-hmm. That's not real conflict, right? It's not strong conflict. But here, in this episode, we realize that no amount of conversation is going to change the fact that Chidi will never have a soulmate if Eleanor stays in the good place. Right. And even if she does earn her place there, he'll still feel like he's missing out. She's taking his soulmate's place. So this is a really strong conflict that you kind of don't get until this point in the episode. We don't really know why he's so frustrated. So a lot of this episode feels like that kind of mundane conflict. We're just bickering, we're squabbling. Yeah, for me personally, I just thought that he was frustrated because she was taking up all his time. Yeah. And that was... That was as deep as it went. Yeah, and that is a con- that is a conflict that could be solved with the conversation, right. right? Like, hey, give me some more time to myself. Okay. Done. done. Conflict over, right? But we see that the roots go so much deeper than mm-hmm. that. He deserves to be happy. I Yeah, I just felt so terrible for him in this moment. Okay, moving on. Tahani admits to Michael that she looked at the rankings. In a flashback, Tahani and her sister are at the reading of her parents' will when the lawyer tells Tahani that her parents misspelled her name. Michael reassures her that she has nothing left to prove. Oh my god. Misspelling her name in her her parents' will. Tahini, like the sauce. They're the the actual worst. They're so terrible. That's why she's so fed up. She's just, you know what? They're dead now. She can't earn their approval anymore, so what's the point? Yep. But now... It seems like she doesn't care about their approval really anymore. She just cares about beating her sister Mm -hmm. and getting out of her shadow so that other people around them in their community will realize that she is also special. Tahani is Camilla to Eleanor's Tahani. Oh, okay. (laughs) I know, that sounds super weird. Oh, okay, yes. if Eleanor is Tahani, Mm -hmm. then Tahani is Camilla and Eleanor sees Tahani as the worst, just like Tahani saw her sister as the worst. Yeah. It's a sense of competition. It's and her sister's wondering extremely if she's, talented. Yeah, and wondering like, can she really that be that much better than me? Mm-hmm. But then seeing that being confirmed at every turn, even yeah. with the lawyer <laughs> who confesses a So that's that's an extended yeah extended scene of the will reading and it's super weird. It's super weird. Um, the lawyer confesses her attraction that is not necessarily sexual, but, but also deeply, deeply sexual, sexual. Uh, to Tahani's sister, Camilla. I can see why they cut that part out, because it's not really relevant. It doesn't really it's add like a lot. It's like another foot, like, stepping on Tahani, like, oh my god. She can't turn anywhere without somebody fawning over her sister. Mm-hmm. She can't go mm-hmm. anywhere. She's never going to escape everybody loving her sister, no matter what ridiculous situation it is. Yeah. Which is another part of the unreliable narrator that you brought up earlier. Like, did this actually happen? Or was she yeah. just something was set offhand that she blew away at her proportion? Like, yeah. oh, you're looking very pretty today, Camille, or something like, oh my God, why don't you just get a room? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, maybe she is remembering it uh, being a lot more elaborate than it really was. Yeah. I think this is a really sweet moment between Michael and Tahani, where he just... (laughs) Where he just shuts her down completely? No, no, right before that, when he's saying, you know, like, out of billions, you made it here, and you don't have anything to prove to anybody. And he reminds her, the rankings are over when you die. Like, you can't change that. Mm Mm-hmm. They won't, uh, they won't get any higher no Can't matter what you do. Up. And, uh, and yeah, all of that really sweet moment where it's kind of fatherly. There's a little bit of like parental undertones to that scene I found. And then he completely undercuts it by saying, no, I had nothing to do with you. You're not the reason the sinkhole started to repair itself. <laughs> I found that interesting that Michael says that he, that Tahani was not the cause of the repairs. Yet Michael admits moments later that he has no idea what caused the sinkhole to start repairing itself good point so how does he know it's not her how does he know all right so let's wrap up our episode the next day nina and bart leave and chidi meets eleanor at the lake eleanor tells him that she understands his frustration 
and she gives him a card to hold up whenever he needs time to himself. That says fork off. Eleanor. Fork off, Eleanor. Yep, I like it. She gives him his exact vision of paradise, a rowboat with wine and French poetry. The episode ends with Michael telling Eleanor that they need to find the source of the problem. Eleanor did the dishes! Did she? Yeah, she yeah. was. it was so sweet. In this uh, extended version, we see Nina and Bart leaving yes. and, they, and they point out uh, to Chidi that Eleanor left you a note by the dishes. All of them are clean. Definitely a little... A little gesture from Eleanor, which I thought was really sweet because it was it was something that was getting on his nerves. Mm -hmm. And that's not like, you know, the most important thing. But she's recognizing, hey, I have to try and be better to him. And I have to I need to put in some effort here. Right. I can't just think about how I feel and what I want. She's empathetic. She's never going to have a soulmate either, like we talked about earlier. And she knows that they're never going to be soulmates. But she cares about him. She appreciates what he does. And she recognizes that he deserves happiness too. Mm -hmm. Like it's not all about her. And I feel like this has to be one of the first times that Eleanor does something this kind and this selfless. I mean, letting the guy go ahead of her at the ice cream shop was good. It was a good start. Mm -hmm. But it's set up for putting somebody ahead of her. And she's going to do that with Chidi. Oh, I didn't even notice that. That's a nice, that's a nice point. Yeah. I think this scene's just really touching. I just like that she says, you know, I know that we'll never be soulmates, but we're friends. And this is the first time I think that either of them has really defined their relationship in that sense. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to see that we're moving forward. Yeah. Like things are progressing in that relationship. And they're not shoving this relationship down our throats either, which... I'm super thankful for because sometimes shows you can really tell when the show wants to get these people together. Yeah, there are a lot of shows that make that mistake of trying to push a romance too hard and then finding out that their audience is not reacting well to it. Or they do it for so freaking long. Yeah, and they don't let their characters get together. And There's all these moments. I can just think of a couple off the top of my head like Castle, Bones... Uh, we are watching The 100 right now, and I completely don't buy Clark and Finn together, and I roll my eyes every time they're on screen, because I feel like the show is trying to get me to like them, it's but I don't care. It's I don't see, see the that chemistry. In the show. Yeah. yeah, so I'm really appreciative that the show is not doing that. They're not forcing romance with any of their characters. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's pretty much all my thoughts until we get to the spoiler zone. Do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap up our episode for our non-spoiled listeners? Join us in the spoiler zone. I actually don't. If no, If you don't. haven't watched it. But if you yeah. have, then definitely do because we got some juicy tidbits. Come on down. Follow us. Yes. Come into our magical spoiler land. <laughs> and that'll bring us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and a review on iTunes. We love reading your reviews. We love hearing what you guys think. And this is the best way for other people to hear about the show. Yes, if you have any thoughts you want to share, you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. And please use the hashtag FBullshirt so we will see your tweets. Or you can find us on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And you can visit our website, multiverseradio.ca. We'll see you next week for our review of episode 6, what we owe to each other. Ciao. Ciao. What are you, like, sophisticated now? I belong in the good place. Au revoir. Spoiler zone, spoiler zone, spoiling everything, spoiling movies. <laughs> it's food. Spoiling the song. Oh, it's, it's movies and then food. Yeah, movies, then food, then Brad Pitt. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like a really weird hierarchy. I feel like we should just leave this. <laughs> we spoil this song, guys. It's the spoiler zone. I don't know. So, first thing I want to talk about in the spoiler zone is... 
Eleanor's reaction to Chidi. I have to wonder if Eleanor reacted so negatively to Chidi calling her a full-time job and a burden was because maybe she heard similar things from her parents. If you watch her reaction during that scene with Chidi, she looks crushed. Mm -hmm. Actually really hurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we find out in the last episode that Bart and Nina are just act, but they're literally just there to create more stress for Eleanor and Chidi. And you can totally see it when you're watching the episode oh, again it's so obvious that super obvious you can't help but wonder like why didn't i notice this the first time around mm-hmm. why was i not suspicious of these two like people watching for the first time like how are they not catching on to this yeah and i totally didn't though so i can't blame anybody yeah that's such a brilliant move from michael and uh when we see the bedroom doors close and the uh, the giant clowns there with the music. Bart says, well, that's terrifying. But he looks pleased. Almost proud of Michael for having that in the house. I just, I didn't even really think about that. Because nobody's there. Nobody's watching anymore. Chidi and Eleanor are gone. Yeah. So his reaction is completely genuine. Mm-hmm. Like, that is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And we brought up in... The main part of the podcast that Michael undercuts Tahani's newfound sense of self by telling her, yeah, none of this had to do with you. Yeah. This is not your influence at all. So you have nothing to be proud about. So when you're looking back and maybe thinking, well, why is Michael trying to make her feel better when he set this entire thing up to make her feel bad? Yeah. Right. And to stress her out. Why would he make her suddenly feel better about it? Probably so he can lift her up just to knock her right back down again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, the whole entire bit with Janet, right from the start of leaving the complete technical manual just obviously on display. Yeah. And discussing the sinkhole problem right in front of Tahani. Yes. It's just such a... Janet appearing right there. Yeah, it's just such a bait. It's perfect. I love it. Oh, yeah. It's so obvious looking back. When you're looking at the complete technical manual and the display for it, big green letters, neighborhood ranking. You're like, everything else is small font, small. It's very discreet. You got the weather section and, and then bam, big and bold, neighborhood rankings. Like, how could she not see that? So. And really, why would you even have that in a technical manual? You wouldn't. And especially if the rankings don't matter after you're gone. Yeah. As soon as you die, if the rankings stay whatever they were, then why would you bother having them in a technical manual? Doesn't make a lot of sense now, does it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. And the last thing I want to point out is Chidi's theoretical fantasy even stresses him out. <laughs> The poor guy, he doesn't even know how to row a boat. Oh god, when he yells out and you see him in the middle of this lake, terrified. How do you row a boat? <laughs> oh my gosh, the it's The oars perfect. are literally right there. This, But this poor guy has directional insanity. Even if he starts rowing, he's literally never going to get off that boat. He's going to go in circles. He's just going to go in circles or like never be able to find the shore somehow. I'm certain that Eleanor had to go back and he was probably like in the middle of the lake that night and Eleanor had to, I don't know, throw him a lifeline or something. That poor guy. (laughs) So this episode made me think a little bit more about Janet and whether there are multiple Janets. Okay. Because at the very beginning, she was the ice cream lady. Yes. Like she was at the ice cream store. Mm Hmm. Which is interesting. Why wouldn't someone else be working there? Right. So, well, I feel like most jobs wouldn't have somebody working there. Or, why are they not self-serve yogurt? Why is there not a machine that's just like, you say what you want and it is in your hand? Yeah. Why do you need a Janet there? Except for maybe comfort. You're used to somebody serving you, so... Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's all these self-serve yogurt places now. And if everything is free, it would make the most sense to just have it be like a Menchie's. Right. Where you just go and get your yogurt and peace out. So do you think that Janet knows what she's doing in The Good Place? Do you think she 
understands that Michael is manipulating these four people? No. Or if she does, she doesn't care. Because she doesn't really have a moral compass. Right, she's think. not programmed to care. Or Michael could literally just say, you can't care about this. Mm-hmm. You can do whatever you want, whatever people ask you to do, except you can't talk about these the specific place. things. Yeah. Right. It's interesting to think about Janet's limitations. Yeah. Or her guidelines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, of course... We talked a lot in the main part of the podcast, too, about how Tahani is meant to be in the good place, and she did make it there, and right. that her was intentions... The, that was the email that we got, didn't, which uh, she won't hear us unless she listens to us again. Yeah, and she might decide to binge all the episodes and then and then catch up with us. Yeah, so if you're listening, then you'll know that Tahani did not make it to the good place. No. She did not. That being rich and having all of those resources and raising all of that money... Didn't matter. Didn't matter because her intentions were corrupt. Her motivations were selfish. So it is more like the Judeo-Christian heaven Mm -hmm. in -hmm. this aspect. Yeah. Or in this version. So... Yeah, she did it for fame. She did it for... You know, her parents' approval, which, of course, she never got. And I don't think she ever managed to spite her sister or to get under, to get out of her shadow. Mm -hmm. I don't think she accomplished those goals. But yeah, yeah. Tahani didn't make it. Did that surprise you at all at the end? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Out of all the people, Tahani surprised me the most. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. You thought that Chidi... He's such a pain in the butt. Oh. I'm have... sorry. He's just so frustrating. Okay. I guess you don't have to love him, even if I do. You can still love him, but you still have to understand how completely irritating... Yeah, yeah, no. He's definitely got moments later in later episodes that are frustrating. Like, when he won't just tell someone their boots are terrible looking... And he can't seem to make a decision, you know, in a romantic partner. Things like that that are frustrating. But I feel for him, I think, more than you do because I suffer from anxiety and I know what it feels like to <laughs> right. okay. feel so stuck between two things and feel overwhelmed with anxiety and not really able to make those decisions easily. Mm-hmm. So I understand him, I think, to a certain degree, but... Oh, yeah, he's still got his moments where you're just like, oh, Cheaty, come on. Because you know? for me personally, regardless of intent, Tahani did incredible things. She raised money, yeah. She raised not just money. She raised like $63 billion. I think it was just 60 Okay, $60 billion. <laughs> That's insane. The amount oh, yeah. of help that you could do to the world with that amount of money is just preposterous. But then we get to the same point that Strangely Little were made. Like, yeah, you can raise all that money, but does raising that money make you a great person if you have all of those resources available to you? Like, if it's so right. easy for exactly. you to do that. And that's what I feel like it doesn't matter. Yeah. Intent should not matter for that situation. I feel like it still should, in I a way. I think that intent, it should be relative to the situation. Okay. So you can hate everybody in the whole world. You can crap on everybody. But if you raise this amount of money for all these corp organizations and charities and whatever, then it should negate all of your crappiness. There's a really great advertisement that I recommend everybody watch starring Thomas Jane. It's like a two and a half minute ad. It's just this complete jerk who hates everybody, is rude to everybody, who does terrible things to people, and then he dies, and you find out that he's an organ donor, and he saves this person's vision, he donates his kidneys and his lungs, whatever, he just donates all his body parts and he saves a bunch of lives. The fact that he was such a jerk in life, does that mean that he wouldn't go to the good place? I don't know. 
that's one of the things is you, it depends. If you're just a surly person, maybe it would outweigh it. If you're a terrible person who went around murdering people, but then you were an organ donator, probably not. Mm -hmm. So in this example, Thomas Jane never killed anybody. He was just horrible to people. But, but I think that's probably why the ending is so shocking. We've been told this entire time that Tahani and Chidi are part of the good place. Like they were meant to be there Mm -hmm. and to find out that they're not because of one or the other. And yeah. something that we always kind of maybe thought about in the back of our minds, but didn't really think was true. Like Tahani's condescending and maybe she's not as great <laughs> as she seems. Yeah. To actually find out that that's true is shocking. And that that's not, and that's enough to get you into the bad place. Mm-hmm. Just being condescending or no, not to just being frustrated with her family situation and trying to get out from under her sister's shadow Mm -hmm. that's enough to get her into the bad place and that's that was shocking that's messed up and really that's what we're finding out at the end of the show like it's pretty messed up that a lot of people seem to go to the bad place Mm -hmm. but uh listeners i'd love to hear your thoughts about tahani and whether or not you know her her good deeds are actually outweighed by her motivations like Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's right that she's in the bad place? Especially after seeing this episode and realizing, yeah, she might be condescending. She might be trying to assert herself as superior all the time. But it's because she has a massive inferiority complex. (laughs) That's not her fault. Yeah, which is, you know, clearly brought about by her parents and her god-awful sister. So... Now, do we think that the people in charge are just nitpicking all the little tiny little... Maybe. Maybe. Maybe maybe the good place really is that hard to get into. Maybe not. We have some listeners with thoughts about that too, but uh, we'll discuss that later. Yep. Yep. So that'll be all for us in this spoiler zone today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion. And yes, if you have any, any thoughts at all, please let us know. We'd love to hear your opinions. And, uh, yeah. And if you disagree with us, great. Yeah, seriously, if you disagree with us, that's fine. I mean, you know, let us know. We want to hear those thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for listening. We will see you next week. Yes, next week for our discussion of other spoiler stuff. Okay, bye. Bye.